This is a production of Cornell University. Um, you know, from my perspective, uh, it's, it's really disheartening when I see on social media us attack each other and, uh, you know, sort of, I want this, you want that, I value this, I value that. Uh, people value different things. And I look at social media as trying to shout through a straw. Uh, I try to be the most positive self I can be out there because I, can know, I, I know I can piss and moan with the best of them. So uh, I really feel like the title of every talk I give is really just supporting each other through these challenging times. And um, it really begins with safety first. I, I don't know how else to say it. I know all of us operate in an OSHA regulated environment with regard to worker protection safety. And I see a lot of the outrage uh, around what's happening that maybe workers aren't protected. And of course our frontline healthcare workers and now our military and service personnel that are actively trying to address this issue uh, our job ought to be to keep them safe as well. And, and I take that part as staying home uh, and serving you guys and everyone else the best I can from home. Uh, I'm able to do it. I have the privilege and luxury of doing that. And my job's to try to support you guys and our job's to try to support those people on the front lines of this thing. Now, I'm very pleased that Cornell Cooperative Extension has had a long time ex ex extension disaster education network. This is really the centralized location for information around safety issues and updates from the government that address food, agriculture, and horticulture. We're gonna do the best we can as an extension service to get this information, make it available to you. And as Carl said at the beginning, uh, this certainly will be something that you'll get updates to uh, as we keep moving along. Now, how to address this in golf, right? I mean, there's one, there's a big thing going on here, right? You know, Massachusetts says no golf, Carolina says golf. I am not going to, you know, engage myself in what I think about this. Everybody has personal opinions about it. My job is to help you folks manage your golf courses. So um, right now, New York seems to say maintenance is okay. Uh, to be honest, I'm not entirely clear on exactly whether golf's allowed. I know state park golf's or golf is open. Uh, but there probably are a lot more people up to date on this than I can. But whether there's golfers or not has an enormous impact on a number of things, right? Number one, if you're a, a mom and pop operation, if you're not having golfers, you, you got money to pay people. Restaurants are struggling with these things. So, you know, not being open has both an economic and a social consequence as well. Uh, but not being open from a grass growing perspective provides enormous opportunities. Uh, if it's deemed safe to work. Now, Massachusetts golf is open, but they haven't decided if maintenance is, is allowable. They want to approve that on a case-by-case -case basis. And again, we can take the discussion about whether it's safe to go to work and take care of the grass. Uh, again, personally, I have one opinion about it. As a scientist, I have an opinion about it. But from a turf perspective, that's not my decision. If somebody's telling you to go to work or if you guys are making decisions to go to work, this is the problem. The patchwork of rules and regulations make it challenging to have 100% confidence in any decision you make. I've already accepted that. And in science, we live in the world of probability. So right now, if you want normal confidence in all your decisions, you're going to have a really tough time, my sense is, having 100% confidence. And so I would argue that the message to all of you at the get-go is you got to use data and non-biased resources to develop a strategic plan for your facility that addresses the potential various levels of restrictions. What happens if you can't go and cut the grass? What happens if you can't spray your seed heads? What happens if you can't do that? Now, the interesting thing is, I spent my entire career studying what happens if you don't do things. So it's been very interesting for me uh, to now draw on research of things I've done for the last 25 years. And of course, my colleagues across the country that are doing science as well are giving us good information about that. So with that as a backdrop and safety is first, Tom Ford, you gotta love Tom Ford. Tom, Tom must have worked in the landscape business. I don't know Tom Ford. But if you have the chance to review these, this is a great place to start. Certainly, there are more detailed ones, more golf-specific ones. You should have ones, of course, for your facility. But what I like about what Tom does is here, he goes into a lot of the cultural aspects of a landscape and green industry workforce. 
you know, we are the kind of people that in generally are introverted. We want to be out there and about by ourselves. But at the same time, we do congregate a lot, right? And, and lunchrooms. And, and we have other cultures working in our systems that also congregate and finish each other's lunches and do other things with people. Tom addresses this in a really nice fashion. As much as it pains me to say anything nice about the old PSU, this is absolutely one of the best places to start for understanding what your workplace is going to be confronting. Now, let's get to growing graphs. Here's what we know. This is from the National Phenology Network. There's a people that monitor, you know, the progression of the growing season in the continental United States. And they have people reporting these things from across the United States. And right now, from a biological and plant perspective, you can see the number of uh, states and part of the United States that are well ahead, 20 days ahead of normal relative to the spring index anomaly that they use for leafing out. Um, and you can see in the mid part of the country, Kansas, uh, the, the panhandle of Oklahoma, uh, Colorado, the, maybe the southern reaches of Nebraska, even a little bit 20 days behind normal, but overall, everybody's ahead. This is a big challenge. Um, as we have to scale back what we're doing. Now, let's just look in New York. Our forecast website has a lot of data that I would encourage you to use because you're going to need this data to explain to people who use service what's going to happen if you can't do certain things or what's going to happen if you have to scale back. Now, all of this doesn't matter if you're bringing a crew of 10 or a crew of 8 to come in and cut the grass. I mean, there's a lot of things you're gonna find you can do without golfers around. How productive and quick you move through the place when there's nobody around. You don't have to change cups. You don't have to move the tees. It's a very different work environment, but the natural world is pushing the biological world along pretty dramatically. Soil temperatures are a good place to start. They govern a lot. So if you're in the Connecticut River Valley, for example, or in the Hudson Valley, you see some of that uh, growth starting to sneak, sneak up, that soil temperature starting to sneak up the Hudson Valley. And certainly anybody listening from Jersey and South, Philly and South, is already uh, sort of moving along in this area. Now, let's start with the big ones. Mow water, uh, fertilize, pests, things like that. I'll start with my uh, pal, Bill Kreiser, Doug Soldat. I know Bill is with us this morning. Uh, to talk a little bit about this. Greenkeeper is going to also be doing some webinars. But this little graph that Bill did a number of years ago when he was studying primo growth regulation at different rates at different heights of cut really was the origin of a lot of the thinking around collar decline and how growth regulators work based on the mowing height. And essentially, all this graph is showing you is that independent of growth regulator use, if you look at where the growth intersects where there's no growth regulator applied right here on the axis. You'll see that the higher you cut, right, the higher you mow your grass, the lower clipping production uh, you're generally getting. The higher you mow, the greater clipping production. So there's no question about it from a grass growth perspective. If you mow higher, you'll produce less, slower growth rate. And, and don't kid yourself. Growth rate is the whole deal. Okay, now, Frank, if, we, uh, Frank ahead, if I can go. hop in there too. Please do. That, that difference in mowing height was between an eighth of an inch in the red line and a quarter of an inch. So we're not talking about 500 or 750. This is a quarter of an inch increase to go from, to see that, that big of a change in growth rate. So, uh, you know, even small and changes I, or even skipping mowings, we know slows the growth rate down. So those things are, are things that can be helpful. That's right. And, and I think you said in the thing I was reading that you're working on that if you raise it this much, that's a 40% uh, reduction in growth. Is That's what this graph is showing essentially, right, Bill? Yeah, and, and I wouldn't say, you know, you go from a putting green height to a quarter of an inch, but it would be just a small increase. You know, the higher we go, the, the, the slower that, that mowing height starts to, to, to slow down. So uh, even small increases in, in mowing height, you know, can really help to alleviate that, slow that growth rate down. And so I, I'm going to show your graph and you're here and I just want to show it so that as we begin to need growth regulators, when I recommend using data, this is the kind of data you're going to have to be clearer about, Bill, but I don't want to waste another minute. Here's your app. 
And I certainly want to encourage people to use this way of looking at their data. But here's my summary on mowing rapidly uh, as we keep trying to move this along. Number one, don't rush to mow. Uh, check your growth. Um, I think I would start at a higher height right away. If you haven't started mowing, why not, you know, let it grow higher as, as Bill's data is showing, particularly at the putting green level. Now we can have a different discussion about the fairway height, but at putting greens, if those are deemed to be the ones you're gonna care for the most and send people in on a regular basis, I think you should maybe consider top dressing uh, right now to allow the canopy to fill because if we have to let this thing go a little bit longer and we wanna come back in and drive, drive the height down to make it playable again and whoever knows how long, having that base built up is also going to help you lower the height uh, more effective, effectively. And then I recommend using PR, PGR strategically. And then I think there's a lot more to come on this. Now, Bill, since I got you, what would you say about raising heights on fairways? Would you, if you're normally at 50 and you got bent grass fairways or POA fairways, um, would you let them go to 70, you know, 0.75? You know, I don't know if I see that if you're doing bent or bent pole, I don't know if we really see the reduction in growth rate from going from, you know, 500 to 750. So I don't know from a slowing growth that we'd see the perspective. But if it does mean that you can stretch out your mowings because you're, you're able to abide by the one third rule better, then, you know, that makes that become a lot more um, uh, attractive of an option there. So, right. If you leave it at a higher height, then to follow the one third rule, you're letting more growth occur before you come back. Exactly. In simple terms. So, yep. so let's talk about PGRs right here, Bill. And I know you're going to talk more about this in your Greenkeeper uh, seminar with Doug today. And I know you've got a publication plan. We seem a little bit early here in the Northeast to really get these growth regulator programs going. However, my big question around this is why couldn't I go out at a, a high rate if I've greened up a willing to let some phytotoxicity to occur to maybe get a month or three weeks of suppression? Is that a crazy idea or is it something that's feasible? I think it's feasible, especially if there's not a lot of traffic. If the golf courses are closed. Um, you know, we've, we've been able to do a significant amount of phytotoxicity uh, in our research on purpose, and we've been yet to actually kill, uh, you know, the bank grass. Maybe the POA wouldn't be able to like it if we did it really aggressively with some of the PGRs. And I'm not even going to say it's a trim it, cutlass, or a primo thing. It's all about how much suppression you're getting. So the trim it just gives you about double the amount of suppression at the label rate that Primo does. And so one of the reasons that you get more risk of phyto is you just get more growth suppression with it. So that and seems so, like a good thing at this time, Bill. Yes? Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, it comes back to we need growth to handle and recover from traffic and wear. And if we don't have much traffic or wear and we can tolerate a little bit of discoloration, then fine. Um, and, and, and slow those growth rates down. And so uh, doing an application now, I think if, if the foliage is not greened up, like here in Nebraska, everything just goes brown. So I don't know how much, say, Primo or a new may, got, may not even get into the plant with all that brown foliage there. So maybe you'd need to look at a cutlass or a trim it uh, to try to get some root uptake to, to really get some benefits out of those products. Um, so if people are doing proxy with their Primo apps right now for seed heads, usually I'd say don't put the uh, PGR in on the first app until the growth rate starts to go to normal. But maybe that's not the right decision in this scenario because we actually don't want that growth rate. We do want it to be slowed down. And so going out with that application might help. And when it comes to those repeat applications to say proxy, I know um, some of the guys at Bayer now are saying to also apply on the 200 growing degree day window that we use for Primo. So instead of just going every two weeks, look at your growing degree days and then make even those second and third proxy applications based on the same growth rate in uh, PGRs that you would be doing for, uh, for, for your, your Primo. So what about, um, I mean, in, in my mind, ah, I lost my train of thought. Ah, so, so, um, so, so let, let me, let me, I, 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 I lost my train of thought, Bill. You were so good. I was so engaged. I, I totally lost my train of thought there. I guess I'm wondering, um, 
are you saying honestly that if I put a pretty high rate of trim it on my pimp, bent pole of fairways because I don't think I'm going to be able to mow them for a while, they might look nasty, but they're going to be fine <clears throat> or over time. Yeah, I mean, it's. I would say that we've we've sprayed it a lot. Um, uh, I'm not too worried about it. The poa is going to be pretty healthy if it is if it survived and is ready to grow. On anyways, uh, it's it's a good time of year for it. Um, you know, the poa. I'm more worried about the the trim it really hurting poa when it's warm when it can't make those sterols that are important for heat tolerance. Right. And so, if we're in the spring, I'm not as concerned. And when it comes to a growing degree day approach, on a bent or a bent poa fairway. The interval for trim it is like 450 to 600 growing degree days. That's like a six, six or seven week suppression window. Uh, and so you can try to get more suppression out of that. So, so let me, let me ask you about the, starting. Let me ask you about yeah. starting. When to start? Normally, I would start when the grass would resume normal, a kind of normal growth rate that I would consider healthy. Um, if I'm looking at this now, when you're starting to see that growth start to push out of the crown, that's probably when I would start the application. I don't know if I'd waste time applying to grass that's, if you're still really cold and your soils are still in the 40s and you're not getting any real growth yet. I don't think I would go just yet, uh, unless there's going to be potential that you can't be on your golf course because it's closed, then you would maybe go make that application. And if the soils are cold and we don't get like inches of rain, that trim it should hang out in the soil and, uh, and should, uh, you know, so, sit there. So, and once the plant starts to transpire, take it up. That's right. So last question uh, before I move to the next thing. What about the other things we apply that have regulating properties? A lot of guys want to get their pre's out. A lot of guys are thinking about summer patch uh, suppression or DM, early season DMIs. I'm going to get to that. But since we're talking about growth regulation, I'm wondering about the other things that we use and that sort of stacking effect you sometimes talk about that overall when we have traffic might be a bad thing, but now might be a good thing. Again, do I have to worry about overdoing it and killing? Yes. I mean, Doug Solat looks like he's on now too. And he oh, just good. said he's done recently saw a 10 X rate of, of trim it with no real ill effects um you know he's not worried about overdose and absence of traffic and i would agree there too um and so when it comes to that stacking effect um it's actually something we have in greenkeeper now i've just built this new model that starts adding all of those products together so we have dmis we have all the, the pgrs and instead of looking at products individually like product primo is giving me 20 percent trim is giving me 30 percent we start adding those suppression points together so the amount of total suppression is 50. And so um, what we're trying to do is start adding everything together. We're getting 5% from a DMI, 40% here. And it does obviously tail off. You can't have 120% suppression, but the model accounts for that. Uh, and so those are one of the things that we can actually do. Say we're trying to get more suppression on our greens. And we know trim it at the high rate, which I think is uh, 16 ounces per acre. And Primo at the label rate, which is five ounces per acre, if I'm getting you know, 15 to 20 percent suppression out of my primo and i'm getting uh 40 percent suppression out of the trim it there i'm getting that you know 50 60 percent suppression in total okay. and when it comes to the amount of suppression again that's relative so if your growth rate is already very slow then it's going to be really really slow but if you start getting into or seeing that spring surge of growth you might need 60 70 80 percent suppression to really keep your clipping yields where, where they want to be right. Yeah. And it go along with that. This isn't some of our research. You know, we've been pushing some of our research greens with, you know, really high rates of nitrogen fertilizer. And then to try to suppress the growth rate back down to a normal level, we would go put down 10x rates of Primo and have zero phytotoxicity. Because at the end of the day, the amount of grass in our bucket is normal than if you're using low rates of fertilizer and no PGR. And so the risk of phyto seems to be much more highly uh, correlated to what the absolute amount of clippings in the bucket is and not what the rate is. Doug, uh, I see you've joined there. Carl, can we give uh, Doug a camera and see if he wants to add anything before we move on here? I can let him use the camera, but he, he'll, yeah, there you go. Good morning, Doug. <laughs> Good morning. Anything no, nothing. Add? Nothing on PGR is I was just starting to think about nitrogen and, you know, this is an opportunity. Well, I guess I should say a little bit about PGRs. I think I hear a lot of people use PGRs on fairways and I say, well, how does it reduce your mowing? And I say, I don't know. We, we still, still mow three days a week. So this is an opportunity to 
to see how things work, you know, try something new, um, reduce the, reduce the maintenance a bit. I, I've, I've just been thinking about nitrogen management a bit here. I'm not sure if we're going to head down that road soon. Let's do it. We're here now. We're here now, Doug, because my thoughts were, again, right now, why would you apply nitrogen? Here's my question that I'm, I'm got to believe people have to be asking themselves. If you don't have golfers, why on earth would you be applying nitrogen uh, right now? If is my first question. Maybe you're worried about diseases and other sorts of things. I, I could, you're going to get a lot of growth stimulation from even applying it. Why apply it? Exactly. And, and this is th something that I've been thinking about the last couple of years is you apply nitrogen to recover from damage and to hit a growth rate. And right now we're trying to reduce the growth rate. There is no reason if you're, if you don't have golfers out there, there's no reason to think about putting nitrogen down. And I know it's something we do almost every week. It becomes a reflex, right? And so that's what I want people to think about right now is get rid of those reflexes. This is a completely different time and nitrogen should be the last thing you should be thinking about right now. It's going to get it from the soil. You're going to, the soil's got plenty of nitrogen in it to keep the grass alive, right? You don't need to repair any, any traffic damage. And I guess the only thing I'll add, and Carl, uh, you brought this up, is, is raising the mowing height on putting greens. Just consider this for a second. If you all of a sudden started to, you know, were able to raise them up to a quarter inch, imagine that. I mean, I wouldn't imagine Oakmont's going to do it, but other places that might say, try to, you know, make their way through this might try to do that. Just think about the pin positions you can put on sloped areas. How much of the surfaces we've lost over the years in the last 40, 50 years because of the way we've been mowing. So for those people that stay open and stay out there, I would still encourage you to lower your mowing height and maybe add some difference in interest as Doug's saying, just change your perspective a little bit on things. You have to look at things a little bit differently and certainly mowing and growth is a place to start. So I want to try to keep as best I can. And I know there's tons of questions. So guys, um, I'm going to get to weeds now and I'm going to get through a lot of this stuff pretty quick, primarily because I think we're a little bit early. We have good data on when it's time to apply your seed head suppression. Now, of course, if you've already done it in the fall, you're locked in. And I would reiterate what Doug said. If you're going to go out, I'm sorry, what Bill said. If you're going out with your proxy normally, we wouldn't tell you to put the Primo in there. But at this time, when you're really trying to shut down growth and you don't have a lot of traffic, then now would be the time to get that higher Primo in there. Right, Bill? I want to make sure I got this right. If I go out my proxy in a normal way, as our recommendations are, I can increase my Primo. Or would you even tell me maybe put trim it in there? Yeah, you're limited on your, uh, you know, what the label will allow. Um, so that you still, you still kind of on those confines, and you're not going to get that much suppression out of the, the primo. And again, if the grass really isn't greening up very much, I don't know how much uptake we're seeing. So maybe using trim it. And if you're worried about that, remember that a four ounce rate of trim it will give you about the same amount of suppression as a five ounce rate of primo. But four ounce rate of trim it seems low to everybody. You always talk about oh, that's a low six is a low rate. Well, imagine that's a six or seven ounce rate of, of primo. And so if you're using four ounces of trim it, you're still going to get about 20% suppression out of it, just like you would have gotten out of that, that Primo. So for that first app, if you're a little leery, um, then that's fine. If you're going to make repeated applications of Proxy, though, you could do the Primo still. And then on your second app, go Proxy Trim It um, to, to minimize that. And from a phyto perspective, when we've mixed the DMIs and the Class Bs like Trim It with um, some of the green pigmented products, we've really minimized that discoloration. So we really are concerned about that phyto. Um, when you make those apps, if you include, like we were testing it with, uh, with the Bayer Stress Guard pigment, and we were really able to show that the, the phytotoxicity was substantially less, statistically less, um, by just including those pigments with those trimmed applications. Copper has a known safening effect uh, on some phytotoxic responses. It is the reason the pigment is in Civitas is because that phytotoxic response from the oil is minimized uh, when you're using copper. It's not masking it, right, Bill? It's, it's preventing it. Yeah, it definitely prevents it. And, uh, and so we've seen that. And, and when we're looking at density and things, to actually see if it's just a green color effect or if it's a safening, it really did seem like even with the class B PGRs that the, you know, the density was still good and everything seemed to be you know, healthy. So if you're worried about phyto, including some of those, those copper-based pigments can really help uh, to minimize that risk. 
perfect. Okay. Um, what about crabgrass? Um, again, in the Northeast, uh, it's certainly by the GDD tracker. Hopefully you're using this tool for, as one of your data tools. Uh, your GDD tracker is telling you in the metropolitan New York area, it looks uh, ideal for crabgrass control as you move beyond. You know, and I wonder how many landscapers are out there doing this. It's obviously time. It feels a little early still, as you can see in upstate New York with the yellow and the cream colored, a lot more time to the further Northeast. But the crabgrass germination still seems a little ways away to me um, based on the soil temperature data that we still see in the 40s when I know I gotta be almost in the 60s to get pretty good crabgrass germination. So there is some indication to get this down. And again, if, if you're not gonna be able to get out there in a while and this is something you wanna do, go ahead and do it. I'm a little bit with Doug. There's a part of me that I would be curious to see what would happen if I didn't do this. Um, but I think for those of you trying to support uh, a business and clients, um, this might still be the safe way to go. I think we've got time and then you've got to decide what weeds will be an issue. Right now, you're going to see winter annual weeds everywhere. And if they start flowering, it doesn't make sense to go out and spray them. I think our perspective on a lot of things is going to change dramatically if, if this lockdown continues and, and if it gets more severe. I think we're still easy early for water. As Doug said in nitrogen management, um, you know, if the water's not moving through the plant, as you can see here, this is, this is the excess water that we have throughout much of the Northeastern United States. We have slight deficits in the most Northern places, but in general right now with the sun angle and the cloudy weather and the rain we've been having, I don't think too many people are thinking about water and I would even caution people, don't be in a rush to get it fired up. What happens if we get cold again and you've got water in those pipes uh, and we get down into the twenties, especially in upstate New York. So I wouldn't be in a rush uh, necessarily to get this going. And again, for disease, I asked Bill earlier about the DMI drenches. A lot of guys are gonna be thinking about their early summer patch sprays, uh, particularly on annual bluegrass putting greens. Looking at the GDD tracker was still early for those dollar spot applications. And if you think about the, the summer patch models, the 55 and 65 degree triggers, we've got a little ways uh, until that happens. Now we are expected to be normal temperature moving forward. So we may have a couple of weeks yet. So again, keep this in mind. If you're talking to people about what's essential, you have a little time, but if you have to prepare for not being able to get in, this could get worse. Ben McGraw made a pretty strong statement yesterday about ABWs that I heard pretty loud and clear. And I'm sure you're going to hear more from him and a lot of other folks while we're all locked down. And I think it's still too early. In fact, what Ben said clearly is if you're going out there trying to get adults, you're probably knocking down more beneficial insects than you are the actual pests you're trying to control. So I would urge you right now in the metropolitan New York area and in places where annual bluegrass weevil is a particular problem, to get, if you're there, get out and look around, get some lemon joy soap, look at the videos on scouting that Steve McDonald has done, the resources that are out there, get data. Don't just do things the way you've always done them because they've always worked that way. We're in a very different environment right now where you have to be more strategic and tactical about the things that you're doing and allowed to do and communicating that to your people that you work for is absolutely gonna be critical. Now, that's all I wanted to say as far as formal presentations, Carl. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so we can look at each other and see if there's questions uh, while we get going here. So um, yes. where do we wanna go, Carl? Well, uh, I think we got most of the questions. Uh, the only one I saw was what, what is a uh, high trimmit rate, but <clears throat> I think Bill covered that. Um, no other uh, questions that I see, uh, unless anybody else, uh, any of the participants, uh, you got any uh, burning questions, uh, send them through real quick. Um, and I'll just and ask Doug while you're putting that together, Carl. I didn't put a lot in there on nutrition, Doug, and, and it's because I actually don't think it's really much we should be thinking about for the next couple of weeks, but I could be out in left field on this. Uh, what would you say beyond nitrogen? Because, you know, you know how things work, you know, maybe we need some calcium, might need a little bit of boron to get things going. And I'm just a little nervous that, um, you know, the concern we have for our economy is going to drive us to, you know, try to do things that are going to have virtually no value. Can you speak for a minute a little bit about that? 
Yeah, you know, it's a it's a good opportunity to to see what happens under under minimal fertility management. I think you know fertilizer programs are one of the most inflated, over managed aspects of the course. And so now, what I'm recommending is you just stop all fertility, and you're going to be fine at the end of this, right? So it's going to, it's going to help you be a, a more efficient manager. Now, you know, you got anthracnose on your, you got a lot of annual bluegrass. You might, you got to pay attention to your potassium levels still. And what we've known from uh, Wayne Cousseau is that the best way to get potassium levels up in a plant is to put a little bit of nitrogen down with it. So when you're using a, uh, you know, a, 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 you want to get something other than nitrogen into the plant, you ha it helps to put a little bit of nitrogen down too. Um, but in general, most places aren't going to need any, any inputs through this period. Yeah. So, hey Doug, I got go ahead, Doug, go ahead, Carl. Yep. So there is a question about um, nitrogen relating to certain diseases. So anthracnose is one. Uh, I think we've seen nitrogen rates go down over the last couple of years. And uh, at least Rich Buckley will tell us anthracnose risk going up. Um, are you worried at all about certain diseases and low nitrogen, uh, or is that something that we're going to have to wait for for more summer conditions, summer drought stress uh, to see? Yeah, you know, most of my I'm, I'm a bent grass guy, right? So, so a lot of my bias is, is there. Uh, I would say though, you're you're probably not going to see as much anthracnose if you're raising the mowing height, you're mowing less frequently, you don't have golfers out there, so you know you're going to see differences there. I wouldn't say, hey, we gotta we gotta get on top of this and do all the normal fertility practices to minimize anthracnose. I just don't see that happening. What you're going to see is more bent grass come in. You're going to see annual bluegrass. It's not going to, your annual blue is going to, isn't going to die, but it's going to lose the competitive fight. And you're going to, at the end of this, if, you, if you're a bent poa mix and you go no fertility, you're going to have more bent grass. And less traffic is also going to favor the bent grass. That's the reason the annual bluegrass is, is more competitive, right? Doug? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so I, guess, I guess it's important. Uh, that's a great question about anthracnose. But remember now, anthracnose, you need a lot of the nitrogen sometimes based on what they do at Rutgers because they stress those things to the point of death. I mean, the, a lot of the research that's come out of Rutgers has been on plots where they know they get it when they stress the turf. So I think inherently a couple of things are going on. One is there may be some latent anthracnose from last year. There was some discussion of that early on uh, that might be lingering and waiting to come on. But I think in general, again, without a lot of other stress, a lot of the plants will, will grow themselves out of this, but we're starting to get some really good questions. I want to stick on the growth thing for a second, Carl. Here's a concerns yeah. with higher trimmit rate and potential frost. Bill, what do we know about PGRs applied before some frost coming still? Yeah, I mean, I've heard that. Um, and uh, we, you know, we've seen it, but we've, we've heard reports, but I make a lot of applications early in the year um, with PGRs and, and proxy. And, um, you know, sometimes I'll see kind of a discoloration that can occur and uh, it, it's nothing that's lethal. Maybe it's mainly the, the, the leaf tips, you would kind of mow it off. Um, you know, it's not like an embark where you see the grass just go completely yellow, um, like you would have saw with, with that. Um, so I, you know, I think it's a concern, but again, if we're just trying to suppress growth rate to minimize maintenance, then it's something that I can live with. Okay, so listen, here's a good question about rough height from uh, yeah. John. How you doing, John, down in Maryland? Looking at raising the height to four inches, drive roots and water needs, reduce mowing. Any concerns on chopping it back to two as long as it's not hot? My first question is, John, if you take it from four to two, I think Bill's going to tell you, you might increase the growth rate. Bill, if you violate the 30% rule, hasn't your work showed you get a faster growth rate? I think the thing that's a little deceiving was we thought that this, the growth rate was faster uh, until we stopped not mowing all year long. And then we measured the total biomass and realized that actually mowing itself at the one third rule slows the growth rate down. It's a natural growth inhibition. So by staying at the one third rule, you are minimizing the number of mowings you have to do and provide producing the lowest growth rate. If you start going to, you know, to more frequent mowing than that, your growth rate is still the same speed, but now you're just mowing unnecessarily more frequently. So if you go up to the four inches, which is a great recommendation, because then you can really stretch out your one third rule to mow when you're at say six inches, uh, just to bring it down, you just would start to be a little bit more, 
um, maybe mowing to the quarter rule and start slowly bringing those numbers down. But I don't see any reason that you know, as long as you don't hack it from four to two, which I assume that they weren't going to do anyways. But if you bring it back down um, with time, you wouldn't see that problem. And I think we could actually learn something from homeowners here too, because most homeowners do scalp it down. And if you do it occasionally, it, especially if it's only been high for you know a couple of weeks, you don't see that scalping. So once that grass has really become accustomed to being at four inches, and then you don't get as much photosynthetic leaf tissue lower that when you remove it to two, it looks yellow. So if it is a really short-term thing, and you, you may not even see that much of a detriment um, from just like a one-time, you know, six-week, eight-week thing, then if we let it do that all year long, and then we scalp it down. So that's absolutely right. I mean, these are things we've never really thought of. And here's Craig Cochran in the uh, uh, Capital District. He's got 27 holes, maybe one guy. Uh, heights of cut, minimum spray programs. And he asks the question about airification. And I'll just take this time to say, I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't really think, I don't, why would you airify? I mean, I'm not sure why. I mean, Doug, am I crazy? You're a soil physical property guy. We're not going to get traffic. Is there a reason why you think we need to regularly airify these surfaces or core cultivate these surfaces in the spring right now? I mean, so I think the approach is, like I said earlier, nothing should be a reflex, right? So there, there, I can think of good reasons to do it. You know, if you got a high organic matter levels and you want to make some some big changes, put the big cores out there, yeah. right? Fill them with sand, do some work. But but if it's a part of your your, your normal <clears throat> routine, that's not good enough anymore. So you got to think, what is the point of this practice? Does it make sense or not? And I think I think people are going to be all over the board on that. Yeah, and, and I think it is important to not be reflex and you make a good point. If you're going to do it, by all means, if you're taking the risk to go to work and you're doing everything you can, you have an opportunity to do certain things that you might not have at other times. So again, your reflex action might be good, but then you make an adaptation to say, wow, you know, I got a lot more organic. I got 5% organic matter. It'd be nice to get these things down. Maybe I should get those three quarter inch hollow tines out because I don't care if I screw them up now, you know, for putting conditions for a while. So that's a, a really good question about airification. Now, uh, interesting question about leaving clippings on the greens. What do you guys think about that? Not physically removing the clippings if you really don't have to play. So I've think? maintained backyard putting greens since I was a 15, kid. right? Yeah. So I'm used to like not having to mow every day. Well, you know, but last year I was still mowing at 80. So I, I still have my normal golf high expectation. But one of the things I always do is return the clippings. Um, you know, once it's dry, it doesn't stick to the ball. You don't even know they're there. Um, especially if golf is low and you don't want to fertilize, get that that in there. And when it comes to, you know, with mowing, skipping mowings, people are doing clipping volumes. If you're doing clipping volumes and you're skipping your mows every other dime or even and maybe every two days and you mow every third day, especially if your growth rates are slow, you're going to notice that your total cumulative growth rate is going to be less over that year because you're not mowing it every single day and stimulating that putting green response that you showed early on. So um, I would leave the, the, the clippings on there as a source of, of nutrient. Um, so you don't have to fertilize uh, unless your growth is starting to get high and, and maybe you, you, you want to slow down, then you, you take them off. But um, I wouldn't, if it's from a labor perspective, if it's going to continue to slow things down and you can just get out there and just mow greens and then just be done and then skip it for three days. Like, that's fast and easy and it's getting the job done. And that's the way I would approach it. Yeah, and, and not picking up clippings, raising the height of cut, uh, three days. Where does rolling fit in, Bill? When, when I know that, you know, in the transition zone, bent grass greens, particularly in the transition zone, Sorokin showed pretty clearly that you can, you know, skip, you know, alternate mowing and, and rolling that way. Uh, I've always felt rolling would sort of save me some mowing and also give me some traffic. You know, I think one of the things we don't think about, but but Doug mentioned, without traffic, we're going to have more bent grass. There might be a value to not mowing, but rolling sometimes. What is that going to do to growth uh, at the early stages here? Bill. What? Uh, <laughs> I thought you said Doug. No, Doug. All right, Bill. Sorry, I was reading the I was reading the the questions. I'm sorry. No You're just talking. No I'm reading that's questions. Okay, that's okay. No, yeah, I was typing on the panel. I wasn't no, listening no, either. That's okay. So, so, what about rolling? What if I start rolling and skip and mow? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, 
And why, why do you have to roll? Why don't you just skip a mowing? Right. And I guess I'm wondering about the value of my place for putting a little traffic. There's a follow-up yeah. question here about top dressing, uh, the sand working its way into the canopy. If I raise the height of cut, am I going to have more organic matter accumulation? Yeah, that's a good thing. When you guys are rolling talking about the involved, rolling might be involved. Uh, the the study you showed the study the collar height versus the putting green height. We talked about that earlier. So when we when we ended that study, we had big problems with those collar because it was all in a green. We had problems with those collar height plots when we tried to bring them back down to mowing height. So I'm not a huge fan. I, I'd say if you're at like 120, go up to 140, 150, but don't be, be bringing your greens up to collar height at this time because you're going to have organic matter issues. You're going to have sponginess. So, uh, you know, keep things reasonable. Do these little tweaks, but don't don't do massive changes like that. Um, what about top dressing to let the grass grow through it, Doug? That was an early suggestion. You, you like it or not? I don't think so. Mowing greens doesn't take that long, right? So it, I just don't, I don't like that. I don't like making a massive change like that right now. I think we're going to be through this. We're going to be playing golf this season. So I would try to keep, I would try to tweak things rather than massive change. Okay, and then so, Frank, uh, to, go ahead, go ahead, Carl. To add on to that, uh, what's the effect of growth regulators if you are um, worried about that root um, and the organic matter buildup? Um, is that going to have an effect? Uh, how is that going to affect root growth, I guess, is, is the question we're looking at. Uh, from a PGI perspective, if you do have very severe phytotoxicity, uh, and I mean that grass is purple, you will see a root prune. And I've seen it with every single PGR. I've seen it with Primo and trim it and cutlass, or not cutlass, Primo, I haven't really tested cutlass that much, uh, but a new Primo and trim it will all do it. Um, and it's just, again, you have way too much suppression. And so you don't need to have that much suppression. When you're starting to see some phyto, that usually means like that grass is, you know, about as slow as you want it to be growing. And then like a Doug put in the chat before, you take the traffic away uh, and we get into some good weather here to grow roots uh, when it's nice and warm and uh, warming up here, I think that the rooting issue is not really a concern when we're, we're alleviating so many stresses by alternating mowing and rolling, uh, returning clippings, doing all those types of things. So I really wouldn't get too caught up just by managing healthy turf system. It's going to naturally push uh, good rooting, and 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 uh, and I wouldn't worry about too much with the PGR unless you're really like severe red. And I, if you see me give a talk, you've seen some slides in which that grass is like like it's painted red, and that would be a problem. But if you're seeing some minor levels of phyto, that's, that's something that I wouldn't be concerned about. Excellent. So, Carl, there's only one last comment here. It's about the sort of essentiality of things. And, you know, we're not really getting into too much of, of what the government's trying to do about what's essential and not. Uh, we're trying to stay focused on the, on the, you know, what are the impacts of this on grass. And we're so fortunate to have old pals like Doug and Bill around that are absolute experts in this area because, as Doug says, we can't be reflexive, but we should be able to think through these problems if we use data and a little bit of science uh, to, to get us through. And, and I'm hoping, as Doug says, that we'll be uh, playing golf yet this season. One